So welcome to Math 409, Problem Solving. And what I want to do today is talk about one of my favorite topics, monovariance. Out of curiosity, how many of you have seen monovariance before? So this is a topic that somehow falls through the cracks in the standard curriculum. And I wanted to just talk a little bit about what they are and how they can be used to solve a variety of problems. The subject is almost more art than math at times. It's not clear for a given problem what is the right way to look at it. And the genius in the subject is figuring out how do you come up with the right monovariant to make studying a problem tractable. And so what I really want to do is I want to go over a couple of standard problems and then talk about some original research I've done with you know, students at Williams and elsewhere. If any of you are not seniors and are looking for things to do in the summer, this is absolutely an opportunity. We have a wonderful summer research program here. Okay. All right. So the standard application I'm going to do is I will do the zombie problem and Conway soldiers to your wonderful problems. Then, as I said, talk about some current research. All right. So hopefully you've seen invariance before. Invariants are things that don't change throughout the process. If you've taken any classes in mathematical physics, you might know about another's theorem, you know, where she was able to prove that if certain uh, quantities are conserved, uh, I'm sorry, forces have certain symmetries, certain properties are conserved, which is an absolutely wonderful result. So a monovariant is a quantity that only changes in one direction throughout the process. So can anybody think of a monovariant associated to yourself? Age, right? What is something that is not a monovariant associated to yourself? Weight, right? So weight is something that will go up and down. Sadly, height is not a monovariant. As we get older, we give back a little bit of the growth we've had. For a lot of processes, we can find a quantity that is only going to change in one direction. That doesn't mean it's always changing. It could be constant at times, but it'll either be never increasing or never decreasing. So there's a whole slew of problems you can do. So I've posted a, li a link to a bunch of uh, problems on monovariance. I strongly urge you to just go to that and you know, try to find one or two problems that you find interesting and try to solve. I'd like to get us to the point where we're presenting to each other in this class. And so if you see any problems that you find exciting, just let me know. Okay. Has anybody here not seen a zombie movie? Is anybody here unaware of what zombies are? All right, there's a lot of different variants of zombies. The version I will use is once a zombie, always a zombie. So there is unfortunately no cure. And how are we going to determine who becomes a zombie? We're going to use a square checkerboard. And if you share two walls with zombies, you become a zombie. And so once you're infected, you're always infected. So in this initial configuration, it shouldn't be too hard to figure out who gets infected next. Anybody want to tell me who's infected next? Bottom will be. Row one, row two, row three, row four. So who gets infected next? Yes. Row three, row three, column three, anybody else? So row three, column three, she has two walls who so will be infected. Does anybody else share two walls? Row four, column two. Row four, column two. So two people get infected. And then we can ask, well, what will happen now? And we'll see that there's a couple of other cells that get infected. So at the next moment in time, we have two more infected. And if we go forward in time again, we see two more infected. So things initially don't look so good for humanity, but the zombie apocalypse stabilizes. And we see that there is a you know, L-shaped region of the board where the zombies never enter. And so my question is, can you give me an initial state that ensures that eventually everyone is infected. I want the most smart ass, easy answer you can think of. Give me a configuration of the board that guarantees that at some point in time, everyone's infected. I'd be very upset if you don't give me a smart ass answer. Yes, right, start with everyone infected. So we know it's possible to do, just infect everybody. This is of course expensive. This costs on the order of N squared zombies if the board is N by N. Can somebody give me a slightly simpler way, not the simplest, but a slightly simpler way that will ensure everybody's infected at some point? All of the minus the corners. So all of the minus the corners. So, so you could start picking away a few. Does anybody think of a, a nice pattern that will give a positive percent reduction? It'll still be of order n squared. 
So you could pick away just a few squares. Well, no, that, that's optimal. That, that's not order n squared, that's order n. Can you give me something that's still of order n squared? Yeah, a uh, chessboard or checkerboard if you prefer checkers. It's very easy to see that in one moment in time, everybody gets infected. And it becomes an interesting question maybe, what is the fewest number of squares you need so that everybody gets infected in one moment in time? Is this the best? Or can you do something with even fewer? Almost surely you can do something with even fewer and ensure, oh, I don't know. Or maybe you, maybe you can't do better than this, that if you were to remove one of the squares in the center, there would be no way that that would be infected in a moment. So it might be an interesting question to see what is the minimum number of squares infected you need so that everybody's infected after one iteration, after two iterations, and so on and so on. And then of course the question was, what's the fewest number you need to infect everybody? We had a suggestion to do the diagonal. There's two possible diagonals you can do, the main diagonal or the other one. Almost every mathematician chooses the main diagonal. And you can see what happens as you expand the uh, time, you know, one unit at a time. It suddenly takes a moment for it to transmit from the iPad to the screen to the projector, but you can see it's moving, it's moving, it's moving, and pretty soon everybody's infected. So we were able to infect everybody on the n by n square if we start off with n infected zombies. So of course the question is, what if we had n minus one infected zombies? Is there a clever way to put them to guarantee that at some point in time, everybody will be infected? Does anybody have any thoughts about a configuration that will work or how you might try to show that there is no configuration? How should we attack a problem like this? And the way we attack this problem is basically the way we attack every problem in mathematics. So I'm giving you the n by n problem, asking is there a way to choose n minus one cells so that everybody gets infected? How can you start? What should we try to do to get a sense of the problem? Okay, so what should we do first? So I'm giving you an n by n problem. What should you do first to get some intuition? I'm sorry? What n? One. one, right? Try to do it when n equals one. Okay. We have zero zombies to put down. So clearly we're not gonna be able to do it with just a one by one board. If we have a two by two board by symmetry, we talked about symmetry last time with the chess problem, there's really only one point where we can put the zombie. I don't know why I chose the upper right corner right here. Does anybody know about the chemistry problem and professor, the professor from Duke, does anybody know this problem? And I'll have to send that later. There's only one square for infection in the two by two. You have some freedom as to where you draw it, but there's only one square. And we clearly see in the two by two case, not gonna happen. For the three by three case, there are three distinct configurations up to symmetry where we can put the first infection. In the first two cases, there are then five choices for the second one. In the third case, there's only one. And what we can then do is we can see, is it possible to infect everybody? The last case, it's very easy to see it's not gonna work. And similarly for the other ones, with a little bit of effort, you can see it won't work. So after doing the one by one, the two by two, and the three by three, we see that there's no way to have everybody infected with N minus one. But maybe this is a result of small n. With the chess problem we did last time with the queens, there was a way to put down five queens on a five by five board so that three pawns are safe, but there was no way to do four queens so that a pawn was safe, I think. I'm not sure about four. Definitely there wasn't any way to do one, two or three queens on a one, two or three by three board. So you have to be careful about small values being misleading. All right, so let's think a little bit about the problem. It turns out that there's a beautiful monovariant we can attach to this problem. And this is the genius of you know, coming up with something like this. The more problems you do, the more natural this is and the easier it is to start to think about what might be the right monovariant. And we'll see later today that there are some natural things we can try 
that leads to some painful algebra. And you have a choice. You can either do the painful algebra and work with the natural thing, or you can work with something that's a little bit less natural, but has nicer algebra. There's really no wrong choice. Okay, this is very different than, uh, than uh, calculus. You know, when you do multivariable calculus, you could have a nice integrand and a horrible region or a nice region and a bad integrand. I'd much rather have the bad integrand and the nice region. So here, what we notice is let's let our quantity be the perimeter of the infection. As time passes, the perimeter never increases. So imagine we have two cells infected with zombies. Look at the cell between them. So we're going to assume right now that that is not infected. And we're going to assume that the vertical neighbors are not infected. So that the wall coming from the infection that's part of the perimeter is just going to be two units, okay? When we now infect that new cell, we lose those two units, but we gain two units above and below. And so the perimeter of the infection hasn't changed. Of course, instead of doing two horizontal, I could have done one horizontal, one vertical. And we see again that there's no change in perimeter. If I do three that are infected, well, now I have three internal walls. I lose the three internal walls. And I gain one external wall. The perimeter has actually gone down by two. For some things, it would actually be very important that the perimeter went down by an even number. For some things we look at, this would tell us that the parity is not changing. We don't actually need that for this problem, but it's just something to keep in mind that maybe it matters that the change is only an even number. Nope, not this time. Our parity is whether or not it's even or odd. So what is its remainder when you divide by two? For some things you look at, what is the remainder when you divide by three? I don't know the good generalization of the word parity for three. It might just be the residue is probably the best word you could use. You know, anybody know what comes after twice? Thrice and after thrice? Yeah. We don't really have a good word for something that you do four times. By then, most people are frustrated and have moved on to something else. And so we don't really need you know, a word for you know, four times. What if we had all four neighbors infected? Well, then the perimeter goes down by four. So we see that the perimeter never increases. Okay, so imagine we have n minus one zombies initially. The maximum possible perimeter, if they don't share any internal walls, is four times n minus one, which is four n minus four. What's the perimeter of the entire square? The whole big square. Four n. So the whole perimeter is four n. And so since the maximum the infection can ever be for its perimeter is four n minus four, there has to be at least one square that's safe. We have no idea what that square is, but no matter how you put down n minus one zombies, there must be one square that's safe. Now, of course, as soon as you know one square is safe, the natural question to ask is, well, how many are safe? Is it possible that there's just one safe square? If you think about the board, could every square be infected but one? So there's a couple of places where that one uninfected cell could be. It could be a corner. It could be you know, a non-corner on a perimeter on the outside, or it could be internal. If it's internal, it's going to have four infected neighbors. It clearly becomes infected. If it's on the boundary, but not a corner, it's going to have three infected neighbors and becomes infected. If it's a corner, it has two infected neighbors and it becomes infected. So what can we immediately deduce? Well, we know that there's at least one square that's safe. Is it possible that there's only one square that's safe? Okay, why not? So every square has at least two neighbors. So if there's only one square that's safe, then that square would be infected one moment later. So the proof initially only tells us that there's one square that's safe. We've immediately improved it to there's two squares that are safe. 
So my challenge to you is can you prove that there must be a column or a row that's safe? In the initial thing we showed you, we had this L, we actually had a row and a column that was safe. So my question is how many squares must be safe? We know there's at least one, we fixed it to at least two, how far can you push this? What's wonderful for a lot of these arguments is sometimes you prove a little result that then starts a process which you can push further. So the most difficult part of this problem is figuring out that you should find a monovariant and that the monovariant should be the perimeter of the infection. All right. Next one I want to talk about is a uh, pub from John Conway. It's either Conway soldiers or Conway's checkers. How many people have never heard of John Conway? Okay, very famous math professor at Princeton. I was fortunate to have him for you know, a few classes and to just get to know him. He hung out in the common room of the math department all the time. Absolutely wonderful person to talk to, incredibly sharp. One of the best lecturers I have ever heard in my life. You know, he can take the most absurd things and turn them into fascinating stories. He's found deep math in the most shocking of places. And you could do almost an entire semester on things he's discovered. And so what I want to do is I want to talk about his soldier problem, his checker problem. So unlike earlier in the semester when we had a finite budget and we only had you know, a five by five chessboard, we now actually have an infinite by infinite checkerboard. This is the difference between Princeton's endowment and Williams endowment, right? So we have an infinite by infinite checkerboard and we're going to put pieces at every integer pair x, y, where y is less than equal to zero. And the way the game is played is you can do a vertical jump or you can do a horizontal jump. And when you jump, you remove the piece that you jump over and where the new piece lands, where the piece lands, that's the only thing that remains. And the question is, how high can you move a piece? So I'm not gonna bother asking, you know, can you move a piece up to at least one unit? This is pretty clear. So can anybody see a way that might get you to two units? Do you think it's possible to get up to two units? Here's a configuration that gets you a piece one unit high. Can anybody see a way to get something two units? Good. So we jump the piece that was to the left, and then we jump that over to the right, and then we jump that one up. And that will give us something that's two units high. There's another way to do two units high. There's lots of different ways of doing this. And then of course the question is, can you do three? Can you do four? Can you do five? So one possibility is to actually just let you go home and you just think about this for a while and just see how far can you push this. With a little bit of work, it's not too bad to get something of height five. You know, I'm sorry, that's something of height three. I could probably you know, move these two pieces up here, move one over here, move one up over there. And that's already gonna get me something of height three. With a little bit of work, I can get something to height four. At this point, I've got one, I've got two, I've got three, I've got four. Do you feel confident? How far do you think you can push this? Do you think you can get this arbitrarily high? So it seems like that might actually be possible. It is unfortunately quite likely that small data can be misleading. We saw this in the original chess problem where initially there was no way to put down funds. And then eventually we start finding an explosion of the number of squares that are safe. Here, it turns out you can't move a piece to a height of five or higher in a finite number of moves. And we can show that very easily by introducing a monovariant. So I'm going to just have you stare at this for a minute or two and try to think what the hell would you choose for the monovariant? So has anybody seen this problem before? I have to raise my hand for the disclosure. I, so if you've seen the problem before, you can't say what you think the monovariant could be. Does anybody have any thoughts about what might be a good monovariant? It's okay if it doesn't work. Any thoughts? Yes. Okay, so one possibility is the initial number of rows of pieces, but we have infinitely many rows and we're only allowing ourselves finitely many moves. So we will still have infinitely many rows when we finish. It goes infinitely many down and each row has infinitely many pieces. You know, Princeton has one hell of a budget.
I wonder if it's enough to buy the nest pack. Might be. It would, it would be close. I, I think they might be able to do it. You know, definitely if they you know went in with Yale and Harvard. You know, set up some luxury condos. All right. Any thoughts about what might be a good mono variant? What about perimeter? Would that be a good thing to look at? Or does perimeter not seem as natural for a problem like this? So let's try to think. One, how many people have ever played chess competitively? So when you write chess programs, one of the big things you need to do is you need to figure out what is the value of the board? What is the value of the position you're in? That's really the most difficult part is figuring out how much is something worth. At times, you are quite willing to trade certain pieces if it gives you a much better positioning on the board. You know, maybe it puts the other opponent's pieces out of the way and then you can launch your attack. And so you're willing to make trades. So taking that knowledge here, Maybe we need a way to assign a value to each board. Well, if I'm going to assign a value to each board, to each configuration, I need to assign a value to every square of the board, depending on whether or not there's a piece or no piece on it. Yes? Okay. So you're on the right track, but the problem is you've got to be careful. Even though we're in a physics classroom, we cannot deal with infinities casually. Oh yeah, and, and that are, that So you, you okay? So maybe you're only looking at the change. Oh yeah. Okay, so if you only look at changes, then there's an infinity lurking in the background, but it's an infinity that's never touched. So you might be okay with something like that. Another thing is taking what you said is maybe we're going to have some valuation depending on what row we're in, but maybe you decrease the amount as you go further and further down. And if we decrease by a multiplicative factor, we might have something that converges. So taking your idea and expanding it a little bit, the target we want to hit, let's say we want to try to get a piece five units above. So I'm going to put a value of one there. And then each square, I'm going to associate a value. I'm going to use the Manhattan metric. So what is the one thing Manhattan does well relative to Boston? Be very careful as I'm a Red Sox fan and the Yankees just eliminated us in how you answer. What does Manhattan do well? The grid system. So in Manhattan, you can only walk, you're essentially north, south, east, west. And so for any point, I can ask, how many units you know, east west and how many units north south is it? So if it's I units east west and J units north south, I'm going to put on a value of X to the I plus J. So everything that's next to the target gets a value of X to the first. Everything that's two steps away would be X squared. Everything three steps away would be X cubed and so on and so on. And if I choose X appropriately, you know, I will assign a finite value to the board and further, um, I can show that if there's a piece at one, the value of the board will now be too high. That as I go through the process, the value of the board never increases. So we'll show that as we do our different jump moves, the value of the board is a monovariant, it never gets larger. And if there was a piece at one, the value of the board would be too high. So let's do this a little bit more carefully. So as I said, uh, at the point that's I, j steps away from t, we associate the value x to the i plus j. And so let's figure out how much each row is assigned. So the zeroth row, it's immediately, you know, the, the first piece to look at is the one that's five units down from t, so that's going to get an x to the fifth. To the left and the right will be x to the sixth, and x to the seventh, and x to the eighth. So when we look at that, <coughs> it's going to be x to the fifth plus twice the sum of x to the k, k goes from six to infinity. All right, well, that's just two geometric series starting at x to the six. So I pull out an x to the six, and I get one over one minus x. I add x to the fifth by using common denominators. 
and I get one plus x to the fifth, I'm sorry, one plus x times x to the fifth over one minus x. What's the value of the negative first row? So if the zeroth row has this as its value, what's the value of the negative first row? Same because just multiply by x. Everything in this row is one step further from the target than the piece above it. So we just multiply everything by x. So in the negative second row, what would you multiply by? x squared. And so we now have another geometric series. So we would have um, what we had before times x goes from zero to infinity because we want to include the zero row. And so we get one plus x, x to the fifth over one minus x squared. We can take any value of x such that these geometric series converge. So what can you tell me I must be, must be true about x? If I want these sums to converge, what must be true about x? So I need the geometric series to converge. What must be true about X if you want a geometric series to converge? Less, almost, be a little bit more specific. No, not less than or equal to. So if you want it to be real, it's between minus one and one. It turns out we will choose a real value of X, but you could choose a complex value of X if you want. If we want the geometric series to converge, we just need the absolute value of X to be less than one. So whenever you see a sum in a math department, you should always ask, what do I need to make sure it converges and not just formally be working with things? And it is possible to go down very dangerous paths, working with things that don't converge and then pull out some very strange things. I have a proof of the Riemann hypothesis where I do something illegal along those lines. All right, so let's look at the two possible moves. So we lose two pieces and we add a piece. And there's two ways this could happen, one way, is that we could add a piece that's further from T, or we could lose two pieces and add a piece that's closer to T, you know, our target. Well, if we lose two pieces and add a piece that's further away, clearly the value of the board hasn't gone up. You know, each square has a positive value. We lost two pieces and replaced them with a value that was smaller than either one of them. So I don't even have to worry about the first type of move. It's the second type of move that I have to worry about because that could increase the value of the board. So I have to worry about what happens, for instance, let's say where I had this jump from x to the sixth jumps over x to the fifth and lands at x to the fourth. So I lose x to the fifth and x to the sixth and I gain x to the fourth. If that is, you know, if x to the fourth minus x to the fifth minus x to the sixth, if that is positive, then I increase the value of the board. So I want that to be either negative or zero. So let's make it zero. So if I want it to be zero, okay, well, I can factor out the x to the fourth and I get one minus x minus x squared. Does anybody recognize the polynomial one minus x minus x squared? Or if not that polynomial, a more famous cousin of it? The yeah, it's, it's basically related to the golden mean. Normally the golden mean is x squared minus x minus one. This is one minus x minus x squared. They are quite closely related. So the golden mean, the Fibonacci numbers are going to come into play for this problem. It's another you know, absolutely surprising application of Fibonacci numbers. And so when we solve this, we get x equals negative one plus or minus root five over two. We want the positive root so that we are assigning positive values. And so we get that the uh, value of x is phi minus one, where phi is the golden mean. So our monovariant is gonna be the sum of the values of the squares with checkers. And we just saw that our two types of moves, one of them does not change the value of the board, the other one decreases it. So if you look at the value of the initial configuration of the board, no matter what you do, you can't beat it. But what's the initial value of the board? Well, if you plug in x equals root five minus one over two, you get one. If you look at the target being zero four rather than zero five, um, a piece four units, you know, that would give me a value of 0.618. That's less than one. It is possible to have a board with a piece at four and a bunch of checkers elsewhere. 
that does not give a board value greater than one, it's possible. If, however, I have a target at zero or five, well, remember the value at the target is just x to the zero power, which is one. So the only way I could have that is you know, to have a piece at the target is if there were no other pieces on the checkerboard. There is no way to get rid of infinitely many pieces in a finite amount of time. It can't be done. I did a little bit of searching and it turns out, uh, uh, this is absolutely wonderful. This is one of the things I truly hate about losing the very end of slides on Zoom. There is a footnote here. And so I will post the slides. And the footnote says that there is a infinite version of the game where you can do infinitely many moves simultaneously if they're all a certain type of move. So when you allow yourself certain types of infinite moves, it is possible to get to a checker at five. Okay. So the last thing I wanna do is I wanna talk about some work I've done with students related to Fibonacci numbers. So the Conway soldiers is a nice segue to that. Again, for those of you who are not going to be graduating, if you are looking to do research this summer, happy to chat more with you about stuff like this. And there is a $500 prize if you can solve a problem at the end. Um, I could make it a $5,000 prize. I don't really expect to be paying this out, but I would be quite happy to do so. All right. So there's a lot of ways to define the Fibonacci's. I'll define them as one, two, three, five, and so on, where each one is the sum of the previous two. And an absolutely beautiful theorem due to Zeckendorf is that every positive integer can be written uniquely as a sum of non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So for example, if you take 2022, you know, here is its decomposition. The simplest way to prove this is to use the greedy algorithm. Take your number, and subtract the largest Fibonacci number you can. Look at what remains and subtract the largest Fibonacci number you can. If those two numbers are adjacent, then you're a moron because you could have subtracted this sum. So you couldn't have done that. So you can make this rigorous and you can show that every number has a decomposition. I actually have the record for the most complicated proof of this. I use the cookie problem or the stars and bars problem. It's a much harder proof of this result, but it tells you how many numbers have exactly k summons in their decomposition, which is very useful for a bunch of other problems. Okay. It turns out that this is an equivalent way of defining the Fibonacci numbers. The Fibonacci numbers are the unique sequence of integers such that every number can be written as a sum of non-adjacent terms. So let's start with one. Well, I can't get two because I only have one number. So I have one and two. I can't write three as the sum of non-adjacent terms in the sequence, so I have to add three. But I don't need to add four, four is three plus one. I can't get five without doing three plus two, so I have to add five. I can get six, five plus one, I can get seven, five plus two, I can't get eight. I can get, you know, I can't get nine, 10, 11, 12, I can, I'm sorry, I can get nine, 10, 11, 12, I can't get 13. So as a nice exercise, you can prove that this is an alternative definition of the Fibonacci's. And what I love about this is it means that, you know, something that you've seen many times can be thought of in a completely different way. You know, we've seen the Fibonacci numbers defined through recurrence. They can also be defined through decompositions. What kind of decomposition system do people like to use for numbers? When you work with numbers, how do you like to write them? Base 10. Why do you like base 10? and fingers, right? Computers would like to work base two. You can actually work in a Fibonacci base of sorts. You can work with the second of decomposition. It's not very easy to add two numbers, you know, with their second of decompositions. This is similar to God help you if you have to multiply two Roman numerals. And I think the best way to multiply two Roman numerals is convert each one to decimal, multiply and convert back. All right, so what I want to talk now about is sum and minimality. So we take 18, we can write 18 as 13 plus five, you know, F6 plus F4, or 13 plus three plus two. And we see the second one has more summons. It turns out no decomposition has fewer summons than the second of decomposition. So the second of decomposition is summoned minimal. And once we know this, we can ask, well, what other recurrences are summoned minimal? And so the proof for the second of decomposition is not too bad. So we'll show that nothing can use fewer summons than the second order. 
that doesn't mean that everything has more summons. There are some decompositions that have the same number of summons, it's just nothing does it with fewer. And the proof is to introduce a good monovariant. So if I have a decomposition, let's write n as a sum, you know, a k f k, where the a k's are non-negative integers, we'll define the weighted index to be the sum of a k square root of k. The square root of k should seem a little bit unnatural. The more natural one is to do a k times k. But the algebra becomes a little bit, you know, painful there in terms of how you have to handle some cases. It's a little bit easy to do square root of k. It's important to note we have a bounded process. If I give you some number and I want to look at all of its possible decompositions, only finitely many Fibonacci numbers can be in play. You know, eventually the Fibonacci number is larger than your number, so none of those will, will arise in its decomposition. And if I give you number n, you're never going to have more than n summons anywhere. So there's only a finite number of possible decompositions for any given number. So if you look at all the possible decompositions, it's a finite set. That's extremely important because if we have a finite set as we move, and if we get smaller every time we move, we can't move infinitely often. It has to terminate at some point because it's finite. That's why it's really nice to know that we have a finite space. So we're going to show that this weighted index is a monovariant and it will end in the second of decomposition. And we'll show that the number of summons never increases. So imagine our decomposition is not the Zeckendorf. Well, if it's not the Zeckendorf, then we either have to have two copies of an FK, something that we can then split, or we have FK and FK plus one, which we can combine. And so if we have two numbers, that, two summons next to each other that we want to combine, a little bit of algebra shows square root of K plus square root of K plus one is greater than square root of K plus two. You know, that's not too bad to show algebraically. If we have two copies and we want to split, normally if I have something like eight plus eight, that's 16, I can write that as 13 plus three. So normally it's one summon higher plus two summons lower. You have to be a little bit careful because if I have two copies of F2, because the Fibonacci numbers really go one, one, two, three, it's a little bit annoying in the beginning. I actually have to split two F2 as F1 plus F3. But square root two root two is greater than one square root of one plus square root of three. Similarly, if I have two copies of F1 that splits to one copy of F2, and again, things get smaller. If I did the more natural weighting uh, in some of these processes, you would not have things strictly decreasing. And so what we see now is that as we go through our decompositions, wherever we start, if we're not at the Fibonacci decomposition, if not at the second of decomposition, we have a legal move and that legal move lowers the weighted index. And we can keep doing this. We can't do it infinitely often because there's only finitely many possible decompositions. And so we have to end in the second of decomposition because if we didn't, we could keep going. So we end in the second door. We never increase the number of summons. Therefore, it's summon minimal. So this is a really nice application of monovariance. Now, one of the advantages of having smart students is they can generalize the hell out of things. And so instead of the standard Fibonacci numbers where each is the sum of the previous two, they looked at a more general linear recurrence. And they were able to show that it's summoned minimal if and only if the CIs are non-negative integers where they are strictly, where they are monotonically increasing. So unfortunately it's sad that it's dropping the, it's greater than or equal to, greater than or equal to, greater than or equal to. So C1 is the largest, C2 is the second largest, C3 is the third largest. There can be ties among them, but the coefficients of the recurrence have to be non-increasing. And if that is the case, it is summoned minimal. If that is not the case, it is not summoned minimal. So they did both ways. All right, so for the last little bit of the talk, I want to just talk a little bit about a game related to this. And so I created this game years ago to play with my daughter. Uh, one of my uh, students worked on this as her senior thesis. We've extended it in numerous small REUs, polymath REUs. If anyone can figure out how to win this game, I will give you $500. If you want $5,000, talk to me. I'm willing to move it up a little bit because it's been quite a long time. So the way the game plays, <coughs> is we have two players, they alternate, whoever moves last wins. And you start off with, you know, each bin is a Fibonacci number, F1, F2, F3, and so on. And you start with N pieces on F1, everything else is empty. 
And on your turn, you can either take two pieces in adjacent bins, say F3 and F4, and replace that with an F5, or you can take something that's doubled, say two copies of F4, and do an F5 and an F2. And again, you have to tweak it a little bit if you have you know, two things on F1 or two things on F2. And so does the game terminate? And if so, how long does it take? For each end, who has a winning strategy? And the last thing which is blocked off is what is the winning strategy? So for example, if we start off with 10 pieces at F1 and the rest are empty, there's really only one opening move. Player one has to take two pieces from F1 and put something on F2. So now we have eight on F1, one on F2, and everything else is zero. And if you look, eight times one plus one times two is 10. It still sums to our initial number. We have two possible moves. I can take a one and a two and give me a three, or I can take two ones and give me another two. Let's do another two ones and get a two. So now at this point, I could do two ones giving me a three. I could split a two and get a one and a three, or I could do a one and a two giving me a three. I'll take two F2s and split it. Well, at this point now, there's only one move available. I take two ones and make a two. Now at this one, I have several moves available. Let's say I take a two and a three and make a four. At this point, I only have one move available. I have two moves available. Let's say I take two ones and make a two. Now let's say I take a one and a two and make a three. I have two moves here. Let's say I take a three and a four and I make a five. So no moves are left, player one wins. So if we look at a little table to describe what goes on, the number in parentheses is who's moving. And we saw player one was the last one to move and they won. When you look at this table, what looks strange about how I've presented things in this table? Not the last one, but in this table, there's something that should look a little strange in how things are displayed. Yeah, there's a gap. Why is there a gap? Well, there's a gap because at this point, it was player two's turn. Player two could instead have done this move. And if player two does this move, player two now wins the game. And so it's possible, depending on how people play, that both people could actually win a game. And if player two had played intelligently, they would have won. And so the question is, what is the winning strategy and who has it? And so essentially, we just use the same invariant, the same monovariant we did a moment ago to prove that the games terminate in the second row of decomposition. It's exactly the same proof we did before. This is a nice application of the fact that the Zeckendorf is sum and minimal, we will end in the Zeckendorf. Uh, we have upper bounds for how long the game takes. We have bounds for which is the fastest game. We have a conjecture that if you just play randomly, the distribution of the length of games is gonna be a Gaussian in terms of you know, how long the games take. What I wanna quickly do is show that player two has a winning strategy. And the idea is if they don't, if player one has the winning strategy, player two actually has a way to steal player one's winning strategy. This is a parity steal argument. It's one of the most brilliant ideas in game theory. It is sadly non-constructive. We have no idea how to do it. We just know that theoretically, if player one has a way to win, you can steal. I'm gonna show you this idea with a simple problem first. Uh, the game is called Chomp. So you start off with a rectangle of dots and whoever moves last, loses. And if you choose a dot, let's say I choose this dot here, you read everything from that dot above and everything from that dot to the right. So clearly if player one wants to lose, they just go in the lower left corner and they lose immediately. It turns out player one has a winning strategy. And here's the proof. If player one has the winning strategy, player one plays it. If not, if player two has the winning strategy, they can steal it. And they steal it as follows. So let's assume player two has the winning strategy for this board and player one will go in the upper right corner. Player two has the winning strategy. So there's gotta be some move from this point onward that will lead to a player two victory. I don't know what that is. For the sake of argument, let's say it was going in that blue dot in the lower left corner. And now player one goes, wait, wait, wait. I didn't mean to do my move. I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean that. Take over. What I wanna do is I wanna go where you went. 
because we were assuming player two had the winning strategy. And from this configuration, player two is going to win. So by changing their move, player one now takes this spot. And so they've been able to switch the parity. This is that parity argument we were talking about earlier today. And player two can now ensure that they win. So how does that help us? So here is the game board. And what the wedges mean is they just mean which Fibonacci bins are filled. So the one to the n means I have n tokens on just F1. The one to the n minus two wedge two means I have n minus two tokens on one and one token on two. And what you do now is you, let's assume player one has a winning strategy. And it turns out as long as n is at least three, player two has the winning strategy. And we're gonna prove that now. We're gonna prove that player two can steal. So we'll assume player one has the winning strategy. So I'm gonna color things pink if player one has the winning strategy. So player one is going right now, they have the winning strategy. They have no choice of where they have to go. They have to go here and they still have the winning strategy. Player two has two moves. No matter what move they choose, player one is still gonna have the winning strategy by assumption. For definiteness, let's assume they went to the one on the far left. And you just analyze the other case later. So what this means is from this point onward, player one has the winning strategy. Well, they only have one move. That makes it very easy. Now over here, there are three moves that player two can do. Well, no matter which one they choose, player one has to have the winning strategy. So let's assume player one moves here. I claim that that can't be a winning strategy for player one because if player one moves here, it's now player two's turn. Well, when we were over here at that configuration, it was the other person's turn to go. And so we've just changed the parity of who's in that square. So if player one had the winning strategy when we arrived there, and now player two is the one arriving here, player two would have to have the winning strategy. So this contradicts the fact that this could be a winning strategy for player one, and you just propagate things upwards. All right, so I'm not gonna go through all that in detail. I'm gonna just briefly mention some other generalizations. So a couple of summers ago, my students looked at a modification where instead of playing on a finite, I'm sorry, on an infinite board in one direction, the Fibonacci numbers, they looked at a doubly infinite take where you had essentially negative indices. And instead of using the Fibonacci numbers, you use things closely related to the Fibonacci numbers. And this is called the Bergman game, where now, you know, if I start off with you know, the number four, I find a decomposition of four in terms of just the golden mean, not in terms of the Fibonacci numbers. What's nice about this is it cleans up all that annoying stuff about the Fibonacci numbers starting one, one or zero, one, one. And by doing this doubly infinite, it makes things a lot cleaner. We do not know um, if there's a winning strategy in this situation. For the original version, you know, there's a lot of related questions you can look at. We have some results when there's more than one player. Uh, we have evidence for the Gaussianity. We proved that the number of game lengths is actually closed interval. So we have the lower and the upper limits and we know every value in between them is hit. We just don't know what uh, the frequency is. We're looking at accelerated games now where on your turn, you can do multiple copies. If I had eight things on say F4, I could do four splits or three splits or two splits or one split. So you know, in the accelerated game, it, we, we don't know yet who has the winning strategy. We have some results there. And again, if anybody is able to come up with a winning strategy for player two, so I can beat my daughter, it's $500. If you want more, I'm open to negotiation. Uh, so you know, this has been done you know, jointly with a tremendous number of students, many of them Williams, over the years. We have published or are writing you know, a large number of papers like that. And I just wanted to give you, you know, a little bit of a sense of you know, the types of problems you can be looking at with the material that you're learning here. All right, so this is a good place to stop. Let me figure out which is the one to hit now. Okay.